And just a couple of years ago, I think this is really cool, Ken Smith <laughs> showed that um, in certain autoimmune diseases, patients that have an increased expression of this effector program actually have increased flare-free survival. So another example of how the ability to appropriately induce exhaustion may actually be beneficial. So we think senescence is distinct from exhaustion. So I can come back to that later, but it, it is a complicated issue. Um, so while there's this core transcriptional program, these cells are very heterogeneous. So these subsets were first de uh, defined in the mouse model of chronic viral infection, LCMV. So if you take your antigen-specific T cells that are exhausted, you can delineate them on three different markers, TBET, humus, and PD-1. And essentially, these PD-1 intermediate cells that are TBET high and humus low actually retain some prolif proliferative capacity. They can make some cytokines. And we think, at least in mice, these are the cells that are responding to PD-1 blockade. On the other hand, this PD-1 high population, humus high, while they have some residual cytotoxicity, they are no longer able to respond to anti-PD-1, and we think that they represent a more terminally differentiated exhausted state. And as some of you may be aware, there are a number of papers that came out last year basically showing that you can delineate these subsets even further based on additional markers such as TCF1 and CXCR5. So that was in mice. Of course, we're also very interested in delineating the heterogeneity in humans. And so this is work done by uh, Bertram Bench, a postdoc in the lab. So we essentially <coughs> leverage the transcriptomic data with the epigenomic data to pick out exhaustion-specific genes. And he combined this with naive effector and memory genes to make a 44-marker Cytoff panel. So then he used this CD8, basically CD8, uh, T-cell Cytoff panel to analyze a number of human samples. So in this group, he included HIV treated and untreated, uh, healthy controls, lung tills, as well as adjacent healthy lung. And then he visualized this data um, using a TISNI approach. So I'm not going to go into the details of TISNI, because we could spend a lot of time talking about it. And I think Mark is probably way more of an expert than I am. Um, but essentially, what he found was that if you look at the flu-specific cells compared to the HIV-specific cells, which are known to exhibit an exhausted phenotype, they lay in a very different part of this CD8 differentiation map. So they're very different. Um, and the lung samples, I don't have the data here, but the lung samples are really interesting. They both overlay uh, with the HIV-specific, but they also have their own unique um, subsets. He also used a, a program that came out a couple years ago called Phenograph, um, and it's a clustering algorithm. Uh, and through Phenograph, he found 29 different clusters using this 44 marker panel. So this is a, a visual representation of the data. So you're looking at the percent of the CD8 T cells in each of these populations. Um, in these 29 different clusters. So on the top, you have healthy controls, and then HIV patients with mild, poor, severe, and then those that have been treated with heart. Um, and I'll just point out a couple things. So almost all of the patients do have at least a few T cells in each of those clusters. However, you can see that the healthy control distribution looks quite different from the HIV patients. So you see this huge olive module that then decreases significantly in the HIV infected, but then sort of makes a little bit of a reappearance in the heart treated. On this side, you see this very small brown module that increases with severe uh, disease severity and then again shrinks in the patients that have been treated with heart. So I'm not going to show you all of his data, but he's basically found that these clusters do correlate differently with disease severity. And additionally, these clusters appear to be functionally heterogeneous. So that was done through in vitro stimulations. All right, so what I've told you so far is that exhaustion is actually an adaptive state. It is heterogeneous, 
at least in the mice, we know that some of these uh, subsets respond better to PD-1 blockade compared to others. Exhausted T cells are also highly heterogeneous in humans, but we don't actually know which of these subsets is responding to immune checkpoint blockade. So as all of you know, and it has been described uh, in the previous talks, anti-PD-1 therapy has been approved for use in multiple types of cancer. However, most patients do not achieve a durable response. So can we combine known clinical outcomes, looking at responders versus non-responders, with this kind of deep immune profiling to gain insight into exhaustion and reinvigoration? And also, looking at this almost at a, a bigger picture, um, can we use PD-1 blockade <coughs> as a perturbation experiment to gain a deeper understanding into overall immune health, dysfunction, exhaustion, and possibly age-related senescence? So Alex, uh, an oncologist in the lab, asked this question, can CD8 T cell reinvigoration by PD-1 blockade be detected in the blood? So this cohort of patients had stage four uh, melanoma, and they were treated every three weeks with Pembro. And so for this, um, for this study, we used <laughs> what John likes to refer to as our systems immunology pipeline 1.0. Uh, there will be a 2.0 later. That's why I'm saying that. <laughs> um, so this includes 17 color traditional flow cytometry, 45 <coughs> parameter cytop, TCR sequencing, which we've heard a lot about. We do ours, we just send tubes to adaptive and get the data back. Um, mutational burden of the tumors, and also some RNA sequencing. So this work was published, I think, just last week. And basically what Alex found was that there was this proliferative burst that was evident in the blood at three weeks. And so these responding T cells actually had an exhausted phenotype. So they had high levels of multiple inhibitory receptors, including PD-1, and they also expressed high levels of humus and uh, low levels of TBET. So interestingly and perplexingly, actually 78% of the patients had this proliferative burst. However, in this cohort, which matches historical cohorts, we only had a 44% clinical response. So what is the disconnect here? We're actually getting our cells proliferating in almost all the patients, but half of them are not responding clinically. Why is that happening? And so one way Alex tried to tackle this was to combine this immune profiling data with uh, various forms of clinical data and see if we could predict outcome. And so Alex and a biostatistician of, yeah. 29 people, so small. Um, so Alex worked with a biostatistician, Rosie, um, and they basically found that the ratio of proliferating CD8 T cells with the tumor volume, so the total tumor, tumor volume, could predict clinical response. And I know that they used a random forest approach, but that's all I know. I'm going to plead. I'm going to plead dumb immunologist here. So I'm just giving you uh, the cartoon version here. Uh, so you're looking at basically tumor volume on the x-axis and then T-cell reinvigoration measured by that proliferation on the y. And basically, you want to be on the left side of this line. So if you have small tumors and pretty good reinvigoration, your chance of responding is very good. If you have a bigger tumor, you need a stronger amount of reinvigoration to have a clinical response, which intuitively makes sense. You're trying to get rid of more cells. And of course, there are, there are many, many, many other variables that we could include in this kind of analysis, and this is what we're all you know, really hoping to do. All right, so what about long-term benefit? Um, and several of the speakers already touched on this point, um, but saying that the three-year overall survival rate for anti-CTLF Four is about 20%. For anti-PD-1, the three-year is double that, it's 40%. But then it looks like these patients continue to drop off, actually. So why are these patients progressing? <coughs> um, you know, what is really happening to these reinvigorated T cells? So what we really want to happen is to have this exhausted cell 
basically turn it into a really functional effector, and then hopefully then it would form memory cells. And this is really important because if the patient grows another tumor, you want the memory cells there to fight the tumor again. But that, that doesn't appear to be what's happening. So are the, effect, are the exhausted cells becoming effectors and just dying? Are they turning into something else? We, we have no idea. All right, so to get at this question of durability, uh, John and a former postdoc in the lab, Kristen Pawkin, went back to the mouse model of LCMV to try to address this question. <coughs> so they infected mice with LCMV clone 13, which causes a chronic viral infection and induces exhaustion. <coughs> they treated with anti pd one and then they took the mice down 25 weeks later. And what they found was that indeed, with in line of historical data, you do have this enormous increase in antigen-specific cells after treatment, but they crash. And looking on the, the right-hand side here, you, this is looking at a viral load. And so there is a decrease in viral load with the anti pd one treatment immediately after treatment, but if you look 20 weeks out, you've lost this benefit of the treatment. So to try to understand this, they perform RNA-seq to look at gene expression. So what they found made sense was that with anti pd one treatment, you have an increase in effector genes. You also have an increase in cell cycle genes. All that makes sense. That's what we would expect. But the cells were still crashing. So the RNA didn't really help them figure out why these cells weren't converting um, long-term into um, effectors or, and could not persist. So they decided to look at the chromatin. So they performed an assay called ATAC-seq, which assays open regions of the chromatin. So essentially, normally your, your DNA is wrapped around histones. You could think of a, a slinky being twisted many different times. So it's wrapped around uh, proteins called nucleosomes, and then those are twisted up so you can tightly compact your DNA into your very small nucleus. But in order to actually use those genes and access the genes, you have to unravel things to access the DNA. And so what ATAC does is that it um, uses transposons to integrate into the open areas. And so then you just amplify where the transpose is integrated, and then that is read out as the open regions of chromatin. So the data looks like this. So where you have these peaks, you had open chromatin. Okay, and so what they found, this is just a very simple principal component analysis with the ATAC-seq data. So you have naive cells up here. Big difference in the chromatin making effector cells. Memory cells are distinct from effectors, but they're closer, which makes sense. These are cells that have been activated and now they're memory cells. We have exhausted cells that are all the way out here by themselves. So first of all, indicating these guys look like they are their own cell state, just like effector is a state and like memory is a state. They look as different. Um, and if you treat with anti pd one they're directly on top of the exhausted cells, meaning that their chromatin did not change at all. So actually, there we go. So anti pd one treatment does lead to some effector transcriptional recovery, but very, very few alterations to the genetic la landscape. So is, is this what's happening? Are we not actually fundamentally changing these cells? So who cares about epigenetics? Um, I do. I know Arnie does too now. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll take a step back for a second. What is epigenetics? These are st stable heritable traits that are not explained by DNA sequence. Uh, these are primarily mediated by uh, histones, histone modifications, and DNA methylation. They alter the shape of chromatin, whether it is open or closed. Also, they regulate the binding of transcription factors. So in the end, it is another layer of regulation for gene transcription. So there really is a, an exciting amount of mounting evidence from the literature that an epigenomic profile is really what is endowing <laughs> cellular identity. So this is looking again at ATAC tracks, so open chromatin region tracks. <coughs> and these are B cells, T cells, and NK cells. Um, so some peaks, some open regions, are shared by all cell types. 
but actually many of the uh, open chromatin regions, we call them enhancers, that are far away from the genes are cell type specific. So these distal enhancers are really very cell type specific, and they're all regulating the same gene, which means that they're regulating transcription, <coughs> RNA, and then protein. I had a slide, uh, but I decided to take it out, so I'll just tell you verbally. Um, essentially, using, using an epigenomic profile, whether it's ATAC-seq or one of the histone modif uh, modifications, you can cluster cells by type way better than if you use RNA. <coughs> and so this is kind of the text version. So a transcriptome, I like to think about what a cell is doing right now. You know, it's integrating intracellular signals and extracellular signals to make a response at that moment. So it's highly dynamic. On the other hand, an epigenome really tells a cell what it can do. And really, we like to think of what a cell is. It's sort of, you know, metaphysical or whatever, but that's what I like to think of. Um, and this is really shared, shaped by the past experiences, the present experiences, but it also sort of informs future possibilities. So if you, if you think about you have an infection, you make effector cells, so you turn into memory cells. The effector cells and the memory cells, while they're distinct, they're very similar because a lot of those effector loci are still open in the memory cell, they're just not being used. So you can basically access those areas very quickly during the secondary response. Okay. So I think this is really useful in understanding fundamental kind of identity of a cell and then trying to figure out if this has been changed due to some stimuli, such as immune checkpoint blockade. All right, so Alex and John decided to design a trial around this three-week time point. Said, okay, can we do a really deep dive to try to figure out what is happening with these cells? Are they really changing? Is this a transient effect? So here it is, our systems immunology pipeline 2.0. Um, so this is one of the, the NEO uh, tissue collection trials that I think was mentioned earlier by somebody. So our patients in this trial have resectable stage 3 or 4 melanoma. We receive a blood sample and tumor biopsy pretreatment. The patients are given one cycle of Pembro, and then we receive a post-treatment blood sample and the resected tumor, which is the standard of care. And these patients actually continue to receive uh, Pembro for up to a year, and uh, we are getting serial bleeds, but we haven't done anything with that tissue yet. So from these samples, um, again, we're performing high-dimensional uh, flow cytometry and cytoff. We're also going to be including um, mass spectrometry. We just spent six months optimizing this process, so we can start doing it now. It's very exciting. Um, immunofluorescence, so actually looking at uh, tumor slides that have been stained. Um, also mutational burden. We also have plasma from these cells, so we can look at serum proteins. Um, TCR sequencing, as I mentioned before. And also from these samples, we are sorting out four different populations. So non-naive CD4 T cells, Tregs, and then naive and non-naive CD8 T cells. <coughs> Why do we not have naive CD4 T cells? Because the sorter can only sort four populations. I would like to sort 12 populations, but we can't do that. Um, and then on these sorted cells, we're performing RNA-seq and ATAC-seq, which is the assay I just described with the open and the closed chromatin. So some of the issues we're trying to address with this trial, at least in my mind. Um, first of all, we, we really just want to better understand uh, the state of exhaustion in tumor infiltrating T cells. And as I kind of alluded to, does immune checkpoint blockade <coughs> really reprogram cell state? And lastly, does clinical response correlate with any particular transcriptional or epigenetic profile? So I'll just show you some very general preliminary information on the sequencing data. And then if I have time for it, I have no idea how much time has passed. OK. Um, I can show you a very short story about the Tregs. 
All right, so this is a very simple principal component analysis. You're looking at the ATAC sequencing data on the top, the RNA sequencing data on the bottom. I think what is pretty clear is that the ATAC sequencing data, the most variation in that data is accounted for by the cell type. So the Tregs cluster very tightly over here. You have your naive CD8 T cells, your CD4 non-naives, and your CD8 T cells are a little bit more spread out, but they're they're in the upper quadrant. More jumbled in the RNA. But what you do see is a strong segregation based on donor type, so normal donors versus melanoma patients, and tissue type, tumor versus PBMCs. So the chromatin profile is primarily defined by cell type, right, cell identity. And then the transcriptomic profile is primarily being de defined by the environment, so the donor type and the tissue type. All right, and I'm just going to show you some example tracks um, from, this is all post, so sorry, post anti-PD-1, CD8 T cells, looking at naive cells in the blood, non-naive T cells in the blood, and then non-naive T cells in the tumor. And these first tracks will be all the patients merged together. <coughs> so this is looking at an ATAC track for CTLA-4. So I've boxed here the regions that are different. So you can see the peak um, in this, this intron is much bigger in the tumor. And you also have a series of smaller peaks uh, that, do, that are only in the tumor and not in the PBMCs. And this is the normalized RNA count, so as, you, as we would expect, uh, CTLA-4 is upregulated significantly in the tumor T cells. So this is a track looking at CD39, another one of these classic inhibitory receptors. And again, you see these two uh, really interesting clusters of open chromatin regions that do not exist in the PBMCs and, of course, not in the naive. And again, CD39, uh, the RNA transcript is significantly increased. So this is breaking out. It's ugly, so I don't like to show this, but I think it's important. <laughs> so this is looking at the individual patient. So because I sample, let's see, I have 500 samples at this point for sequencing. We don't sequence things to a very, very great depth, which you, it would look this pretty if you did. Um, so these are all of our individual patients. And so you can see that there actually is a lot of patient-to-patient -patient variability. But you do see these areas pretty distinctly only in the tumor cells. So I want to spend just uh, one slide talking about T cell heterogeneity um, in these kinds of assays. So first, I think it's really, it's really important to use the cellular phenotyping data um, to inform what cell types to analyze. So right now, I'm just uh, sorting all bulk non-naive CD8 T cells. And you should be thinking, but you just told me there were so many subsets in there. Like, what does that mean? Right, OK, it's true. <laughs> Um, so I think we really need to use the cellular data to inform what cell types we think are responding, sort them out, and sequence that. I think that's going to be really useful. Single cell technologies. Someone brought it up earlier. Um, absolutely. Uh, Golnaz Vahedi at uh, UPenn has single cell ATAC working really beautifully. So it's definitely something we can tap into. We have a C1. Um, I think doing it on this kind of scale in a clinical trial, very, very expensive and technologically very challenging to deal with the data afterwards. So definitely something we can tap into, though. Um, the use of reference libraries. I think we really, really, really need good reference libraries. So what do I mean by that? OK. Total RNA-seq and ATAC-seq really seem to be, in, in my opinion, the workhorse assays for profiling molecular state with very few cells. And I think interpreting patient results would be significantly improved if you could actually compare it to a reference library of subsets. And this is what I mean. So this is our patient sample. It would be great to be able to compare it to very well-defined uh, subsets using a reference library and compare it which kind of tracks does it look like and what percent of each individual subset can we, do we think is in the sample using a deconvolution approach? 
So I would love to have um, a library of naive cells, these activated naive cells you see in um, the elderly, stem cell memory, EMRAs, effector memory, central memory, uh, CCR positive 7, CCR uh, 7 negative, senescent, exhausted, et cetera. Um, there are some references. Um, there are very few for ATAC, and most of the time it's whole CD4s or whole CD8s or naives or non naives. We don't really have something with this level of granular um, detail that I think would be really, really useful. Especially, um, and someone talked about it earlier, if you're taking whole tissue and doing sequencing analysis on a whole tissue, you know, right now someone could tell you how many CD4s are probably in there. But they couldn't tell you how many exhausted cells are in there, or what kind of exhausted cells are in there. Okay. Yes, so they are phenotypically distinct. Um, so John actually tried to study this using um, vaccine-specific, uh, flu-specific T cells. And in the elderly, um, they don't proliferate as well, and they're phenotypically very different from like a truly exhausted cell, like a CMV-specific cell. Um, so they're phenotypically different. They seem to be functionally different. Uh, they proliferate less. Um, the expression of various transcription factors is different. Um, so these are distinct subsets. What exactly that means in terms of uh, a tumor, I'm not sure. But we think of exhaustion as something you're actually inducing with uh, lots of TCR stimulation. And senescence is more something that just happens over time with multiple rounds of proliferation. Hope that was clear. All right, how much time do I have? Like 10 minutes? Mm -hmm. um, so, as far as I can tell, from the evidence that you have so far, there's no way to go from an exhausted state to a memory state. We don't know how to do it. Okay. It'd um, be great. Um, for other kind of, I guess what I'm asking is, is there hope for figuring out how to do that? In the sense of, do people know how to shift mm -hmm. one epitope to another in cells uh, in other settings? Sure. So, I'll, I'll give you one specific example. Um, that has to do with actually enhancers. And so Golnaz's group at UPenn is taking fibroplast cells, and they're overexpressing uh, one of the transcription factors I mentioned, TCF1, to actually uh, de novo open up these T cell specific regions in fibroblasts. And what they see is that that cell actually starts to turn on T cell specific genes. So I, I think that's evidence that there is some hope for really modulating the chromatin to get downstream effects. But there's not a lot of evidence yet, but I think it's definitely possible. So sometime in the future, maybe we'll have both an anti-TD1 and we'll have some treatment that actually switch people. Uh, exactly. <coughs> yeah. So I'm really excited about this very difficult notion of using um, dead Cas9 to target histone-modifying enzymes to specific places in the genome. So if, if we know that these histones in an exhausted cell have a repressive mark and it needs to have an activating mark, can we use dead Cas9 to actually you know, load on an enzyme, target it to that area, and then have it change that histone? A little sci-fi at this moment, but I think it's possible. <sighs> yeah? Um, so a lot of what Um, sure. So it's been shown in multiple kinds of cancer that the T cells do have reduced cytokine production and reduced cytotoxicity, and if you take them out, they do not survive very well. I do think the states are different. I think that exhaustion exists as a spectrum and that there are so many factors that kind of contribute to the state that's going to change in every situation whether you have way too much um, antigen stimulation or not enough co-stimulatory help. So if you're in a tumor and there are no CD4 or T cells to help you, that's going to contribute to exhaustion. And that might look different than if you just had way too much you know, IL-12 or IL-6. So I, I do think these little lines are going to alter what 
exactly the exhaustive state looks like. And those are probably going to be differentially able to be reinvigorated or not. Yeah? Just two quick questions. One, just to be sure that I have the conclusion <laughs> right, um, which is that the quote unquote reinvigorated exhaustive cells after APD1 <coughs> um, fundamentally. fundamentally don't change their epigenetic profile by ataxy or We haven't done that in the humans yet, so that's what we're doing now. <coughs> in the, the nature paper, I there was no ATAC in that paper. There was no ATAC, mm -hmm. but, but the, the expression profiling, mm -hmm. am I recalling correctly, as well as cell surface markers, even after Mm -hmm. were fairly similar. Yes, so they still express inhibitory uh, receptors, high humus. They still look phenotypically exhausted. And, and there are, in the RNA-seq, they had the, they retained uh, the various sets of genes that were characteristic. I, I remember. Yeah, so in the, a, in, in, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what we basically found was if you, if you track T60, uh, sorry, key 67 uh, gene expression by the RNA, it correlated very well with the other markers we know about uh, the map with exhaustion. So even after anti-PD1. Even after anti-PD1. Yeah, so you see this increase in key 67, and we follow it along the time points. You also see UMIS and CTLA4 and PD1 and CD38 and then these other things tracking with key 67. So in all of these studies, you don't know um, what the specific, what proportion of the cells you're looking at. Absolutely. Are specific for the tumor. Absolutely, um, absolutely. So is that a concern? I mean, it's mm -hmm. a concern, but mm -hmm. I mean, what are your thoughts in terms of sure. what you might be missing sure. um, by looking at, at both cells with mm -hmm. the exhaustion Sure. Um, so what we do know is that um, from TCR sequencing, if you, if you sort on those proliferating cells, TCR sequencing, and you compare them to the TCR sequences in the tumor, um, the most prominent clones in each, there's a high degree of overlap. So we think that at least some of the T cells within our proliferating population also exist in the tumor. Um, within the proliferating pool, we are obviously getting things that are not tumor specific because really any T cell that has a high amount of PD-1 to some degree is probably going to proliferate a little bit. So that, that's absolutely true. Um, but we know that there is some overlap in TCR sequencing between the two. Um, the that one. doesn't tell you. Mm -mm. This is one of the things we always yeah. talk about with all of the bulk TCR yeah. sequencing done in tumors is that um, you know, uh, antigen experience cells develop um, homing receptors, integrins, and whatnot that, mm -hmm. that help them um, traffic through tissue. Mm -hmm. And tumor is a tissue, and so to absolutely a, these specific T cells, absolutely these specific tumors, and these specific T cell. Um, in fact, we actually um, did do this with um, with tetramers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the proportion in the tumor was not that different from adjacent normal tissue. From absolutely. So it's just something to keep in mind. Yeah, absolutely. And something else um, I get worried about with this kind of study, giving Pembro and then waiting three weeks, did all of the tumor-specific cells we're really interested in go to the tumor? You know, and we're seeing this proliferator burst, which is important because it's a far more kind of high dynamic effect that kind of um, shows you what PD-1 is doing, but did actually most of our antigen-specific cells go into the tumor? So this yeah. was one of the really shocking things to us from some of the things I showed in the yeah. genetics of the, the manifest uh, assay, looking at now um, T cell clones with Miller specific for mammals, mm -hmm. is the, not only the speed at which they came up mm -hmm. after giving anti-PD-1, but 
also the speed at which they came down. They came down. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's teaching us that we really need to maybe look at week one and two in particular. I totally agree. A lot, literally by, by week three. Yeah. John and I have had at least 10 conversations about needing to set up a trial where you look earlier. Absolutely agree. Um, but in this next, so this trial that we're doing right now, we are actually looking in the tumor. And before it was just blood, so that will help a little bit. All right, um, I'm actually going to skip this next story and just kind of move to my last few slides because I want to spend a few minutes on it. Um, I can tell people about it later. It's really cool. <laughs> Look, new tumors. Okay, that's like the preview. Um, okay, so I'm going to switch gears just a little bit for the last few minutes. Um, humans age, right? And I'm not an oncologist, but I understand that age is one of the biggest risk factors for many different kinds of cancer. You guys can correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so aging leads to dysregulation at basically all levels. Um, I told my dad I was learning about aging. He said, oh, you have to tell me about that. I'm experiencing it right now. Um, so you have dysregulation at the molecular, the cellular, the systems, and the organismal level. And so for a very, very brief primer on the immune system. The immune system, you also see effects of aging. Um, Mark has some really beautiful papers about this. You have fewer naive T cells. You have generally decreased effector functions. Uh, you have an increase in both senescent and exhausted T cells, and you have uh, kind of this mysterious chronic low-grade inflammation uh, that varies per patient, or per person, I should say. And so I'm just going to focus on the molecular level for a couple minutes. I'm going to talk about that with you afterwards, maybe. Okay, great. Um, Okay, so the aging epigenome, yes, the epigenome also changes with age. It's sort of horrifying. So we have a, so histones are the proteins that wrap DNA and basically cause a 3D architecture. Um, so there's a general loss of histones. You have a change in imbalance of these various histone modifications that I've told you about, both activating and repressive. You also have changes in DNA methylation. There is a general decrease, a global decrease in methylation. But actually, at specific uh, CPG islands near promoters, you have increases and decreases. And awesomely, a very small subset of these CPGs strongly correlates with age. So people think that this actually constitutes a methylome clock. So I have this lovely diagram that I stole from a review. <laughs> 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 right? <laughs> So on the, <laughs> I know, on the x-axis here, you have chronologic age. And on the y-axis, uh, you have the methylome, okay? And so most people really fall on this linear line. So you can track your chronologic age with your methylome age. But there are people falling off on either side. So this guy's really happy because he's, he's old, but he has like a really young epigenome, right? And then you have this person up here that's really sad because they're also old, but their epigenome is even older. So you can imagine <laughs> that you know, having a dysregulated epigenome is going to possibly inhibit your ability to robustly reprogram your cells. So I'll return to this point in a second. Um, so I'm kind of really excited about the idea that you might be able to use these CPGs as indicators of general immune health, uh, epigenomic health, sorry. Some other changes in the aging epigenome. You also have uh, chromatin remodeling on a large scale. You have these site-specific uh, losses and gains of heterochromatin, which are these tightly packed regions that are generally um, have genes that are turned off. And all this leads to transcriptional changes, OK? And so a lot of this work has been done um, in model systems of yeast, worms, flies, some of it in mice. And then this was done um, actually in humans. Yay, humans. Um, so you have an increase in transposition. 
Uh, you have an increase in the transcription of repetitive elements that are usually turned off. Um, and you also have an increase in tr cryptic transcription, which is basically transcription from the middle of gene bodies that doesn't normally happen. That was also done in humans. So of course, this has really important implications for the immune system. Because in the immune system, as I described, you need to very precisely turn on an effector response and then very precisely turn it off so you don't cause immunopathology. And so uh, this study came out, I think, just a couple weeks ago. Really simple, but I think really cool. So they basically took young mice and old mice, isolated uh, their naive CD4 T cells, and just stimulated them in vitro, and then performed single cell RNA-seq. And so what they found was that the old mice had significantly greater variability in both the magnitude of the genes being turned on and which genes were turned on, which is bad. Um, and so this particular study did not look at all at uh, epigenomic reasons, perhaps, but I am highly suspicious. Um, so just some questions to, this is my third to last slide. Um, so our decreased effective responses in the elderly, which are at high risk for certain types of cancer, uh, in part due to an aged and dysregulated epigenome. Could this chronic low-grade inflammation that we see in the elderly be caused by a dysregulated epigenome, at least in part? Could chronic low-grade inflammation actually somehow contribute to dysregulating your epigenome? Could this somehow be a really unfortunate positive you know, feedback loop? Does CMV or other chronic uh, stimulations lead to accelerated epigenomic aging. All right, so does a dysregulated epigenome then interfere with exhaustion reprogramming? And especially if we think of this as a highly orchestrated kind of adaptive state. Can we profile a patient's epigenomic age using DNA methylation? Does this res uh, correlate with response to immunotherapy, of course? Um, could this be used to identify patients who t whose T cells may be more or less amenable <coughs> to reprogramming through checkpoint blockade? And does epigenomic aging more broadly correlate with other aspects of immune aging? So I'm just going to, almost there. Um, so what I told you today was that uh, T cell exhaustion is an adaptive state that is influenced by many different factors, including uh, tumor antigens in the microenvironment. Uh, T cell exhaustion, uh, cells are expanded in an aging immune system. And the aging epigenome may contribute to the dysfunction of uh, the immune system on a systems level, but also T cell exhaustion. So I think this is a really exciting time to be a basic immunologist, actually, uh, because we can take real human samples, I'm also pro-human immunology, and do really deep cellular immune profiling using flow cytometry, IF, CYTOF, immune serum analysis, et cetera. But we can also combine it with profiling at the molecular level. So looking at TCR sequencing, RNA sequencing, ATAC sequencing, um, DNA methylation, combine this with tumor genotype and phenotype, and clinical information to really look at each patient very holistically and try to integrate all these different factors in kind of a big picture way to really understand changes in immune health and dysfunction. And I'll stop there. <laughs>